Here's a limerick. To make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of pheranthamine. To fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. This is the first episode of Dirty History to be produced by Muckraker Media. What does that mean? What is Muckraker Media? What's going on here? Well, I've heard from many people who I respect allude to this idea, but it felt appropriate to spend some time on it now. The media landscape we inhabit today is one that provides the service of reinforcing bias. The media landscape, by and large, does not attempt to challenge us, but to echo. And those individuals who do want to challenge and subvert our biases and expectations are often put behind a prohibitive paywall or bogged down by 5, 10, and in some cases 15 minutes of advertising for products totally related to the causes they say to champion. Why the hell do I want a pair of underwear when I'm listening to a history podcast? This is an unfortunate reality. Scholarly work cloistered in the Academy's ivory tower, relegated to journals which can largely only be read by people with the inclination and pocketbooks, or those with a .edu address. Podcasts which once relied on the funding of listeners, or strategic advertising, and hell, even those podcasts that spent 5, 10, 15 minutes on advertising are now locking themselves behind paywalls or putting themselves in subscription services. And when you put up so many barriers to learning, to interesting content, to intellectual material, can you be said to support any of that at all? We should be removing barriers, not building new ones. And that is and always will be the goal of Muckraker Media, to remove those barriers to educational material, to interesting content. And that's why I started the organization, to open source educational material across new media platforms, to utilize podcasts, audiobooks, documentaries, YouTube, film, blogging, to utilize all of these new media platforms to allow people increased access to educational material, to interesting content. So when this nonprofit organization, one of the only podcast-centric educational nonprofits, launches on March 27th, you can go to our website, muckrakermedia.org. You can find out more about the organization. You could support the organization. Or, conversely, you can get access to a whole bunch of new material, blog posts written by some really interesting individuals, on a wide range of topics from history, philosophy, education, economics, film, music, journalism, you name it, it will be on there. And our launch rosters of shows include Dirty History, That's BS, which is a show you've heard before, Plato's Cave, a philosophy podcast, Work in Progress, which is from a comedian who breaks down each of his sets and analyzes what worked and what didn't and improves as he goes along, and it's, it's a funny show, it's an insightful show. You also have Mind Theater, which is a film, television, cultural analysis. I would say in the vein of those video essays that you watch on YouTube that you love so much, it's a terrific show. So when we launch, March 27th, muckrakermedia.org, Dirty History, That's BS, Mind Theater, Work in Progress, Plato's Cave. I hope to see you dropping comments. I hope to see you interacting with the material. I think this is an exciting new chapter for Dirty History and for all of you that listen to the show. So please go check out the other shows on the network. Go read the blog. And get ready for some more material, whether that be documentaries, audiobooks, whatever. And with that, on with the show. This is the second part of an ongoing series on psychedelic drugs. And that means two things. First, if you like your stories in some order or continuity, now may be the time to go back and listen to part one of the series if you haven't already. Second, it occurred to me that throughout the whole first episode, we never really tightened up our definitions of certain things. As such, the concepts lack a real polish. 
Now, don't don't get me wrong here. Everything makes sense from the first episode, but our grasp could be better. And that's because I value clarity, as I think we all should. After all, the whole point of Dirty History is to define and put into focus the extreme edges of the human experience, and we walk that behavior back until we see it in its benign, everyday form. I don't want to be esoteric. I don't want to waste your time. The first episode left a few terms that could use a discussion just out in the wind. What's a hallucinogen? What is meant by psychedelic? These terms weren't created in a vacuum. These terms were not always taken as they are today. In fact, spending a little time on where these words and their uses came from may do us some good down the line. Therefore, when it comes to hallucinogen, it was our old friends from the LSD episode Humphrey Osmond and Abram Hoffer, who provide the most concise and workable definition. Quote, Hallucinogens are chemicals, which used in non-toxic doses, produce alterations in perception, thought, and mood, but which rarely produce mental confusion, loss of memory, or disorientation. The definition is clinical, and really, Any way you slice it, no single word or phrase can effectively summarize the experience under the four classical mind-altering substances, again, which are LSD, DMT, psilocybin, and mescaline. And that isn't for lack of trying. A whole host of words like psychotropic, psychoactive, and to deleterious effects psychotomimetic have been used to describe the experience. Some of these words feel nice to say and they just roll off the tongue. Others discount altered consciousness as something to be institutionalized for. But they all serve a purpose. To categorize these disparate, globe-spanning substances into one easy-to-manage group. And this is all too clear looking at the U.S. drug schedule and other like systems. Outside of that paradigm... Outside of the U.S. drug schedule, outside of like systems, there have been many who have tried with varying degrees of success to describe the psychedelic experience in detail, rather formally or informally. You have Albert Hoffman, Humphrey Osmond, Timothy Leary, Paul Devereaux, Weir Mitchell, Michael Pollan, Joe Rogan, and famously Aldous Huxley. And to continue the trend of leaving loose ends, we left off the last episode with a question. Why, or rather, how, did the attitudes surrounding psychedelic usage change? How did thousands of research efforts, participants, conferences, and grant dollars dry up and disappear in a fog of government regulation and prohibition? In thinking about that question... I realized that structuring each episode in this series around a specific substance had the unforeseen consequence of providing this story with a sense of definitiveness around the idea that each drug had its own story in this broader tale of psychedelia. But that isn't necessarily true. These substances, while distinct substances in their own right, weave in and out of an interesting broader story. No one case ends simply because we're talking about another. Hell, this series doesn't really work chronologically. That said, yes, by the end of this episode, we will be closer to discussing Prohibition in the present day than we were at the end of the last episode. But we will begin our story well before the start of our first episode in this series. And hearing myself speak, I realized that that was much more convoluted than it needed to be, And it's that kind of speaking that contradicts what I was just saying at the beginning of the episode. But anyway, the chronology of this episode, which focuses on mescaline, will stretch back much further in time than our LSD episode. And that is a consequence of talking about the ins and outs of a sweeping paradigm shift rather than a single case study. It's also a consequence of mescaline not being made in a lab, but having existed in certain plants and cacti for thousands of years. So, is a backlash against drugs a concept with its origin in the 1960s, even though the substances far predate that decade? Certainly not. That's kind of obvious. Many substances have been prohibited at various points in human history. Fear is not new. And that certainly, that certainly was the case 
when we saw some of the earliest uses of mescaline some 5,700 years ago by a few tribes in Mexico, but most notably the Huchols. Now, as we go into detail surrounding the use of peyote and other mescaline-containing cacti like San Pedro among tribal groups, we may, and perhaps this was just me until recently and I'm projecting past insecurities, we may not fully grasp the importance of certain elements of ritual that these mescaline-containing cacti were used in. I guess what I mean is that in the peyote use of the Huchols, we see a religious significance not found in Western attitudes surrounding the drug. And as we discuss the Huchol's religion and mythology, certain elements likely won't carry the same weight for us as they did for them. It may and likely will seem dated to some of us. I think this feeling was put into perspective by Joseph Campbell, who said of symbols used in the past that don't carry the same weight, quote, The animal envoys of the unseen power no longer serve as in primeval times to teach and to guide us. Bears, lions, elephants, and gazelles are in cages in our zoos. Man is no longer the newcomer in a world of unexplored plains and forests, and our immediate neighbors are not wild beasts, but other human beings contending for goods and space on a planet that is whirling without end around the fireball of a star. Neither in body nor mind do we inhabit the world of those hunting races of the Paleolithic millennia, to whose lives and lifeways we nevertheless owed the very forms of our bodies and structures of our minds. Memories of their animal envoys must sleep somehow within us, for they wake a little and stir when we venture into the wilderness. They wake in terror to thunder, and again they wake with a sense of recognition when we enter any one of those great painted caves. Whatever the inward darkness may have been, to which those shamans of those caves descended in their trances, the same must lie within ourselves nightly, visited in sleep. Essentially, he is saying that the subconscious of those individuals that have come far before us, the Huchols, we must share something with them today. This may be one of the more distinct differences between the earliest days of mescaline and the earliest days of LSD, and that is spirituality. There is a much larger element of ritual and mysticism in this episode than in our previous one. There may be a variety of reasons behind this. The value systems of the cultures in which the substances were first used, the experience of the drugs themselves are just two of the possible explanations. And I never claim to have the answers. Just some facts. I'm Thomas Thompson, and this is Dirty History. Peyote is one of the best-known plants in the Native American hallucinogenic tradition. The mescaline-containing cactus has been recorded in the artwork of Mesoamerican tombs dating back to 100 BCE. This is significant in that, yes, while there has been archaeological evidence dating peyote use further back, with dating the earliest example of peyote possession back some 5,700 years, Peyote use in artwork at burial sites all but cements the cactus's importance in some Native American cultures. We know that peyote was the cactus used in the burial art due to the cactus's distinctly unremarkable characteristics. As described in Paul Devereaux's book, The Long Trip, quote, The peyote cactus is small, somewhat turnip-like in shape and size, and has no spines, branches, or leaves. Just its rounded crown peeps above the ground, and it is in this which becomes a peyote button when cut and dried. And the most active visionary alkaloid is trimethoxethamphylamine, called mescaline. And to be honest, I anticipated tripping over trimethoxethamphylamine, and I did it two times in a row, which you wouldn't realize how many takes I had to go through to get that. 
But as it was described, the cactus sounds rather unassuming and unimpressive, to be honest. The plant does not seem to be particularly ostentatious. It is unique in its utter blandness, and perhaps some fine beauty in the minimalist design, but I must say, looking at pictures of the peyote cactus, it wouldn't be my first guess as the plant that's going to open the doors of perception. Now, while the episode is on mescaline, and the act of psychotropic in peyote is mescaline, users of peyote describe the experience of taking the plant as an organic whole to be markedly different from a dose of mescaline alone. As an organic whole, the cactus can be eaten raw or dried, it can be brewed into a tea or eaten as a mash, but I have heard, not in academic writing, but on message boards dedicated to these substances, that peyote has a terrible bitter taste and people have mixed the mash in with juice and other sweet beverages like uh, soda or pop or whatever you like to say, and that is supposed to make the experience more palatable. And again, that's what's so interesting about studying these substances. They're still playing a role in our society. What's being written for our use now on message boards and on comments on social media and in blog posts and in articles, that's going to be the future generation's primary sources about these things. Anyway, once ingesting, the effects of the substance manifest in hallucinations. Geometric patterns, complex scenes, some familiar, some unique, enhanced visuals of the environment around you. Another curious phenomenon is known as synesthesia, which is which is the intermixing of sensory modalities. One can see sounds and hear colors. Anthropologists like Western Labar contend that some of the traditional and ritual music and chants from native tribes came from experiences and auditory hallucinations under the influence of peyote. Nishkuntu, or Moonhead, was a prominent leader in the ghost dance, who developed chants and songs based on an experience where, under the influence of peyote, he heard the sound of the rising sun. And today, while we can see examples of peyote use and in Indian groups today and on Vice News and in those message boards I alluded to a few moments ago, these experiences were foreign to Europeans in historical accounting for centuries, until we finally see some early descriptions of peyote use in the Spanish accounts of Aztec culture. Francisco Hernandez wrote of peyote use in 1651 that it was, quote, ground up and applied to painful joints and that it was said to give relief. This root causes those devouring it to foresee and predict things and other things of like nature. And of course, from a place of imagined spiritual and moral superiority, the Spanish outlawed peyote use in 1620. And the substance had to go underground. Now once peyote use was prosecuted by the Inquisition in Latin America, it was then that Europeans finally began to scratch the surface of peyote's role in the rich interplay between various forces, social, spiritual, and medicinal. That said, this scratching of the surface was just that. It was very, very surface level, not deep at all, and it occurred under intense torture, coercion, and persecution of the users of peyote. So any documents from this period, from the Inquisition, while they may hint at this rich peyote culture, which is useful for us, these documents which we are going to use should be used carefully, and with note that in all likelihood some testimony therein was fabricated or exaggerated. And that idea was expanded in 1963 when Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran wrote Medicina e Magica, El Proceso de Acculturación, or Medicine and Magic, the Acculturation Process. And it was in this work that Beltran argues that traditions and practices that came out of the contact between Mesoamerican cultures and European colonizers were a distortion of the ancestral uses, and I think that's rather obvious, but that isn't the source of his focus. Beltran instead fixes his attention on how Indians may have persisted their culture out of sight of priests and tribunals, and if it's out of sight of priests and tribunals, it would largely be out of sight of European historical accounting, which is much of what 
history is based off of, unfortunately. So to the documents, any instances of peyote use prosecuted by the Inquisition was organized as cases of witchcraft and sorcery. Now these cases, while serious to be accused of, were admittedly not as common as hearsay, religious misdemeanors, solicitation, and sexual transgressions, but it is in those witchcraft cases that we learn a great deal about peyote's ritual use. And right here is a great place. Press pause, and we'll recap a few things. Peyote is, or rather mescaline is, to use Aldous Huxley's expression, a friend of immemorially long-standing. And the archaeological record proves that, going back 5,700 years. However, these hallucinogenic plants are all but unknown to Europeans until accounts start to leak out of South America. So if these are friends of immemorially long-standing, peyote was outlawed in 1620. Why? To quote from Angelica Morales Sarabia's chapter in the book, Medical Cultures of the Early Modern Spanish Empire, quote, the skilled use of specific herbs and roots, particularly those with the dramatic effects of peyote, implied dominion over nature itself. And of course, that is a big no-no in the eyes of the Inquisition. However, that did not stop a few Spanish physicians, naturalists, and pharmacists from learning and writing about the substances. Francisco Hernandez was one such figure. As were individuals like Torabio Motolinia and Juan de Cardenas. Cardenas, a physician like Hernandez, wrote about peyote. But he tried in vain to relate the substances in terms of plants commonly known to Europeans. And he ultimately describes peyote in terms of witchcraft and demonology, both of which are not helpful in documenting how he has seen the plant used. And that's one of the problems that these early researchers and writers of peyote would face. What is their frame of reference? Have the structures upon which they learned their trade and field adequately prepared them to talk about this foreign flora? From Juan de Cardenas, quote, In many torrid lands in New Spain, certain little apples are grown, of which the outside pulp can be eaten and is quite tasty, but the inside is deadly poison. And it is truly said about peyote that if taken by mouth, they so truly deprive the poor wretch of his wits that he goes out of his mind. He is visited by the devil, among other terrible and dreadful ghosts, who give him news, so they say, of things to pass. And all this must be appearance and tricks of Satan, whose talent is to mislead with divine permission the miserable wretch. We see in this early writing about peyote the blurring of superstition in religion to explain what the writers were not adequately equipped to explain themselves. This is really par for the course if you're a proponent of Comte or positivism, as he describes a law of three stages, which I think is applicable here, probably because they're the most obvious here. The early writers around peyote were in the theological stage in which the phenomena could be explained by evoking God and his ilk. We hope that we are in the theoretic stage or positive stage, using observable data to reach our understandings, but that is for a later episode. The central argument Cardanius makes is that these plants that cause such visions could never be the natural and intended effect of the plant, as that would imply these substances, peyote and the visions therein, were as God intended. Instead, Cardanius is able to sidestep that pitfall and argue that these substances were the work of Satan. And then this line of thinking could allow the Inquisition to prosecute the cases and not offend the notion of God as the grand designer. Again, from Sarabia and the medical cultures of the early modern Spanish Empire, quote, According to the precepts of Hippocrates and Galen, all plants had virtues and acted on the human body. But the effects that could be expected were limited. Nature contained medicinal plants to cure, poisons to kill, and food to give sustenance to the body. The appearance of ghosts and dark visions, the capacity to see the past and predict the future, and the other effects that Indians and Africans claimed they could achieve after eating or drinking certain intoxicating plants could only be the work of the devil, never a natural effect caused by the plant. So Sarabi is kind of backing up this notion 
that many of the early naturalists would argue that this was the devil's work, therefore they could prosecute the plant, or prosecute those that use the plant, without running into, well, if it's a plant, that means God made the plant, and if God made the plant, how are we going to prosecute people for using what God created? Easy argument, it wasn't God, it was Satan. Therefore, when the 1620 edict banning the use of peyote came down, inquisitors struck down the notion that the plant could have any positive applications. The edict plain, and that it forbade, quote, any person of any rank or condition to use peyote or any other herbs with similar effect or any other effect under any name or color or induce Indians or other people to use them with similar intent. So it was plain. Do not use this plant or anything like it. However, this edict does not immediately end the entrenched cultural practice. Remember, as I said earlier in the episode, this has wide-reaching effects, a wide interplay between society, religion, medicine. It took time to drive peyote underground. Another curious phenomenon occurs after the Edict of 1620. And that is found as you look through the inquisitorial documents, you look at the sources around the tribunals, and you find women testifying, because even though sorcery could be practiced by a man or a woman, it was thought by the leaders of the Inquisition of the time that sorcery and witchcraft would be more common in women, as the devil found it easier to seduce and enthrall women due to their, and I quote, insidiously vengeful and envious nature. So we see many women being prosecuted for witchcraft and sorcery under the use of peyote because it was thought they were more likely to use peyote, because they were more likely to be seduced by the devil, because they were, quote, insidiously vengeful and envious. But we see springing out of this period a cross-pollination of belief systems, a distortion, as Belron would argue, of the ancestral use. But this belief system, this cross-pollination in the Mesoamerican cultures and the European cultures is going to play out further down the line. So put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that a little bit later in the episode because it's kind of happening in modern times, so I feel like it'd be a good, nice way to conclude everything. Now, peyote, however, is not the only psychoactive cactus with a prominent role in many tribal societies. Another goes by many names, depending on where you find yourself. Achuma, Hachuma, Giganton, Agua Cole, Cardo Santo, but it is most commonly known as San Pedro. The name of this plant hints at its crucial role in the shamanic ritual. San Pedro, like the Christian apostle by the same name, is a plant that is the keeper of keys, the guardians of gates to other unseen worlds. It is through the shaman and through the ritual of ingesting this plant that one is allowed to experience states of consciousness that allow visions to this other unseen world. San Pedro, like peyote, has a history that predates any written accounts from the area. San Pedro was most common in the central highlands of Peru, with depictions of San Pedro on rock art that well predate the arrival of the Spanish into the area, so we can surmise that it is a long and storied history. We have spoken at length about these substances, but not about the intermediaries. The rituals I keep blathering on about feature a prominent role of the shaman, who serves as a guide as you venture through the rabbit hole of primordial images, Jungian archetypes that litter the ceremony, in which the Indians take the godhead inside of their own body, similar to how Christians practice communion. So you could see how these two cultures, Christianity and these Mesoamerican hallucinogenic um, cultures or cults as they were called by the Spanish, would kind of you know, mix with each other rather well. And we've talked about that cross-pollination of ideals and systems that can be found in the use of peyote, which, like San Pedro, is a mescaline-containing cactus. San Pedro is found around the Andes Mountains and is most common as San Pedro in coastal Peru. The rituals which accompany the cactus run a similar gamut as peyote, with a focus on divination and medical practice. There is one San Pedro moon ritual which carries with it Christian connotations, even though the plant in use well predate Christian incursion, that just goes to show this cross-pollination of cultural values was pervasive. However, the cacti are not the focus of this episode. 
while they do show the fear surrounding hallucinogenic substances well predate the 1960s, there is a broader story that will carry us closer to the present day. The focus of this episode is mescaline. And to that note, I made a distinction earlier in the episode. That proponents of the peyote cactus state there is a difference in peyote usage and chemical usage. So I want us to think about that. I want us to compare the two as we work through this. So we have the all the ideas of what it's like to be under the influence of peyote and San Pedro, and now we're going to look at what it's like to be under the influence of mescaline as a chemical. What's the difference? Arthur Hefter, a German pharmacologist with a pension for self-testing, first isolated mescaline from peyote in 1897. Well, just a few years later, in 1918, Ernest Spath synthesized mescaline in a lab. Spath, by the way, was an Austrian chemist who, like many, lost most of his physical belongings in World War II and ultimately died penniless. It was actually a student of his who paid for his funeral and commissioned a bust in his honor to avoid Spath and his legacy meeting their end in an unmarked pauper's grave. It just goes to show how fragile someone is in being recorded in history. How easy it is for people to be forgotten. Anyway... It was Hefter and Spath's work that allowed mescaline to be more widely distributed as a researched substance. Like LSD before it, pharmaceutical companies used what it learned from Hefter and Spath to mass produce and distribute on an unprecedented level a hallucinogenic for scientific study. But, as we learned from characters like Al Hubbard, research and scientific study were loose terms. But even in this period of unprecedented production of psychedelic substances, something is really missing. Up to this point in the 1950s, there was no foundational mescaline text. Really, there was no foundational psychedelic text of any great renown at this point. Now, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of writings around the substances and their effects, but I mean a text that popularized it, blazed new paths, and opened the public's eye. Something with staying power. This is a challenge that vexes Humphrey Osmond, the English psychiatrist working in Canada that we heard from in great detail in the previous episode. He quickly realizes that despite the scientific rigor that he is bringing to the field of psychedelic research, it lacks a good description of the subjective experience that the public at large could buy into. The scientific and professional community is one thing, a popular audience is quite another. You could imagine Osmond's excitement when thumbing through his mail, he finds a correspondence addressed to him from Aldous Huxley. Now to understand why Osmond would be so excited about this, we should take some time to talk about who Aldous Huxley was. And it's important to reaffirm that Huxley wasn't the first or last person to try mescaline. But his way of elegantly describing the experience stood out beyond the scientific jargon that had come to typify explaining the psychedelic experience. Huxley stood at a unique place to be the herald of mescaline, especially given the fact that he had a popular audience prior to writing about the substance. But again, what is typically common in people who popularize something, they are hardly that thing's first or earliest adopter. Weir Mitchell, a physician and novelist from Philadelphia, wrote the first modern accounts of mescaline usage all the way back in 1898. Mitchell sent peyote to famous American psychologist William James, who did not have a hallucinogenic experience, but became, as he described, quote, violently sick for 24 hours. And to Havelock Ellis, a British psychologist who described his experience, quote, the visions never resembled something familiar. They were extremely definite, but yet always novel. I would see thick, glorious fields of jewels, solitary or clustered, sometimes brilliant and sparkling, sometimes with a dull, rich glow. Then they would spring up into flower-like shapes beneath my gaze and then seem to turn into gorgeous butterfly forms of endless folds of glistening iridescence, fibrous wings of wonderful insects. The description is par for the course. The writer had a definite vision in his mind, but it all comes across as rather nebulous. Ellis's account predates Huxley. So again, Huxley was not the first or certainly wasn't the last individual to take and write about mescaline beyond the cut and dry academic way of doing it. And to that point, we've already looked at the early Spanish texts, 
Dr. Kurt Berenger conducted numerous mescaline trials. A. Ruher, a French researcher, attempted to establish the course of stages of the trip. And also we have Albert Hoffman's lab notes around LSD with the infamous bicycle ride home. But Aldous Huxley's doors of perception has staying power. Huxley was also the author of A Brave New World, that dystopian novel many are supposed to read in high school. Emphasis on supposed to read, air quotes you can't see. If you haven't, I would highly suggest it. In fact, a little off topic here, but I just read a passage comparing George Orwell, the author of 1984, to Aldous Huxley, again, the author of A Brave New World and eventually The Doors of Perception. It's from the writer Neil Postman, who said, quote, What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. And that's why I'm fascinated by Huxley, because I think he's kind of right here. More correct than Orwell, in that today's culture, it's more about drowning everything out than banning it altogether outright. So again, if you haven't already, you should definitely read Huxley's A Brave New World. And by the end of this episode, hopefully you'll want to read Huxley's The Doors of Perception. But Huxley also happened to be of a prestigious family of biologists, poets, educators, and zoologists. This afforded him certain opportunities that many would lack access to. I only mention this because it ties directly into my next sentence. While Huxley was studying at Eton in 1911, Eton, by the way, is a prestigious school that has seen future Nobel laureates, world leaders, intellectuals, and writers grace its halls. As a matter of fact, George Orwell was once a student there, to continue the theme of dystopian novelists and societal critics. But as I was saying, while Huxley was studying at Eton in 1911, he developed keratitis, a disease that left him blind for several years. His vision improved for him to study at Oxford. However, those days were characterized by thick prescription lenses and a magnifying glass. Huxley and his vision is a source of speculation for many. No one knows how bad it got when it got bad or the degree to which it affected his life. It was in 1939 that Huxley, struggling for sight, tried something called the Bates Method. Its creator, William Horatio Bates, argued that the deterioration of eyesight had everything to do with perpetual eye strain and that glasses were not and have never been necessary. Essentially, the Bates method is to not wear glasses in order to alleviate eye strain. Bates also found that exposure to sunlight would alleviate eye strain. The evidence supporting the method is, is anecdotal at best ranging from one or two people claiming they had flashes of improved eyesight to one such account from Huxley's book on the Bates Method called The Art of Seeing, in which he notes, quote, Within a couple of months, I was reading without spectacles, and what was better still, without strain or fatigue. At the present time, my vision, though far from normal, is about twice as good as it was when I wore spectacles. Ten years after the publication of The Art of Seeing, Huxley was giving a speech at some swanky Hollywood banquet. In attendance was a one Bennett Cerf, co-founder of Random House Publishing, and he wrote a column about the event in the April 12, 1952 edition of the Saturday Review. Quote, When he arose, he being Huxley, to make his address, he wore no glasses and evidently experienced no difficulty in reading the paper he had planted on the lectern. Had the exercises really given him normal vision? I, along with 1,200 other guests, watched with astonishment while he rattled Ghibli on. Then suddenly he faltered, and the disturbing truth became obvious. He wasn't reading his address at all. He had learned it by heart. To refresh his memory, he brought the piece of paper closer and closer to his eyes. When it was only an inch or so, he still couldn't read it and had to fish for a magnifying glass in his pocket to make the typing visible to him. It was an agonizing moment. And despite his acceptance of what is essentially quack medicine is that 
account just illustrated, Huxley had a further reaching reputation as an accomplished novelist, screenwriter, and essayist. However, this aside, into his complications with vision play an important role when we look into the doors of perception. Because visual motifs and cinematic hallucinations play a crucial role in the mescaline trip. After all, one sees sounds and hears colors, but is this altered state of consciousness really concerned with one's ability to see? Does 2020 eyesight, when you are thrown into the throes of a mescaline trip, does that really matter? This, believe it or not, has become a source of speculation for some in regards to Huxley writing The Doors of Perception, the foundational mescaline text. So let's connect the dots. Drugs, to the mainstream in the 1940s and 50s, were a preoccupation of deadbeats, criminals, outcasts, and psychiatrists. It was all dope. It was all seemingly pointless and harmful. Huxley, however, in writing The Doors of Perception, attempted to attach mescaline to something more meaningful, to a long and storied history, a plant on the cutting edge of research and a part of the most ancient wisdom. That was Huxley's vision, magnifying glass and all. It was the spring of 1953 that Huxley and Humphrey Osmond's correspondence began. Huxley became interested in Osmond after reading a paper that Osmond and Hoffer put out on a series of experiments that used mescaline. Their correspondence lasted until Huxley's death. The two could be said to be friends, with Osmond staying at Huxley's California home whenever he had to come that way for conferences or professional obligations. On one such house day, when Osmond attended a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association in May 1953, he led Aldous Huxley through a masculine trip. This trip became the basis for the doors of perception. So if tripping is a suggestive experience, and that the ways in which people describe what you will expect ultimately alters what you will experience, what played a role in Huxley's experience? Music, art, film, literature, mythology, how have these things changed the way people perceive the psychedelic experience? That said, I should also mention that Huxley's descriptions are a little erudite, perhaps pompous even, compared to how most of the psychedelic talking heads discuss tripping today. Huxley may come across as a little too prophetic or poetic for modern sensibilities. That disclaimer said, let's dive into some of his writings on the matter. From the Doors of Perception, quote, Black chimneys and green composition roofs glowed in the sunshine like fragments of the new Jerusalem. Flowers in the gardens still trembled on the brink of being supernatural. The pepper trees along the side street still manifestly belonged to some sacred grove. Eden alternated with Dodonna, with the mystic rose. As your furnace, doors separated by gulfs of unfathomable gentine, a last judgment which, after a long time and with considerable difficulty, I recognized as a chair. Of course Huxley wrote the description of his masculine trip in such terms. He was the best equipped of anyone to do so. His description flirts between the holy and the mundane the banal and the celestial, but both are elevated to a level not possible at base consciousness. He takes everyday items and ascribes some spiritual or supernatural significance to them, not able to be experienced in base consciousness. The passage reveals my ideas about literary criticism in that a book or essay is not written in a vacuum. Huxley followed through with an essay that was exactly what Humphrey Osmond needed from Huxley. Osmond presents Mescaline to a respected English writer in the hope that he'll be able to put into words the psychedelic experience, because as we well learned in the first episode of the series, hallucinogens had a real PR problem. News headlines describing all kinds of nightmares sold under the pretense of an objective gaze onto a subjective experience Mescaline and LSD needed a facelift. 
Psychedelics needed an ad man, someone to write copy extolling the spiritual benefits of psychedelic drugs. Huxley describes the experience in religious tones. Psychedelics are something that could bring you closer to God, not insanity. So how do we frame Huxley's contribution to the field of psychedelics? Well, for one, he helped coin the phrase. In a correspondence with Humphrey Osmond, the two men traded limericks about the substance. Well, about LSD and mescaline, largely. These are the limericks we heard at the beginning of the episode. Here's Huxley's. Quote, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of thermanthrotine. Thermanthrotine, Huxley's idea for the name. Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Here's Osmond's. Quote, to fathom hell or sore angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. Obviously, Osmond won there. But this illustrates that not only did Huxley play a role in coining the phrase and writing the popular account, he is at the center of a group of disparate, not always intimately connected individuals who have forged the way many of us think about psychedelics today, those of us who think about them constructively. Again, because I want to make this plain, while The Doors of Perception was a foundational text in the hallucinogenic experience, it was not the only widely publicized instance of a respected individual partaking in the psychedelic. As a matter of fact, once word got out that Humphrey Osmond provided Huxley with the mescaline, one could imagine that, coupled with the research, garnered Dr. Osmond some degree of fame, for better or worse. Enough fame that in 1955, shortly after Osmond sits with Huxley, Osmond led a session with the British MP Christopher Mayhew for the television program Panorama on BBC TV. Mayhew, a government official, was filmed for the duration of his mescaline trip, guided by Osman, meant for television. You can find the video today on YouTube. However, it never did air on the BBC for obvious reasons. Well, obvious at the time. While Osman, Huxley, the Hoochels, and ancient tribal rites around San Pedro and Peyote have been the focus of this episode, it almost goes without saying that mescaline use goes well beyond these few case studies. Let's pivot and revisit the military side of things. We spoke briefly about MK Ultra, a secretive conspiracy theory-like project and scope and practice. This type of science fiction-esque research did not stop and start with LSD. However, while the CIA was sponsoring projects to heighten people's suggestibility, the OSS, the CIA's precursor, investigated mescaline with the aim of creating a truth serum. I cringe saying that, but this places MK Ultra in a historical context. It was predated by its parent organization's use of mescaline. There seem to be three key developments in the U.S. military search for the holy grail of interrogation, that truth serum. The first began in the early 20th century, with German psychiatrist Kurt Berenger's research into mescaline, which resulted in, among other things, an essay on the mescaline inebriation, in which he stated, quote, The patient has the inclination to reveal otherwise hidden secrets, to express himself in an unbridled way. This statement laid part of the groundwork necessary for investigating mescaline as a tool of interrogation. The second piece was in American mescaline research in the 1920s and 30s, in which a variety of synthetic mescaline analogs, DMA, DMPEA, MDMA, and TMA, were developed and tested on humans and animals with American neurologist Heinrich Kluver, noting of some mescaline trials that, quote, the ability to organize and to abstract material is lost, the determining tendencies suffer, to concentrate on something for a long while becomes impossible. Another prominent American researcher at this time was a pharmacologist named Gordon A. Ailes, who was at first inter interested in adrenaline and amphetamines, but later shifted his focus to mescaline. Much of the research by these two men post-1937 wasn't published until much later and without any reference to MDA, which is 
it might sound familiar to you because it's on the U.S. drug schedule due to its relation to MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy. The third major breakthrough, foundational in the investigation of mescaline as a truth serum, happened when a German communique was intercepted by British intelligence on July 24, 1942. In it, a German officer requested 50 grams of mescaline for, you guessed it, use and interrogation. And since 1943, German military physicians working at the concentration camps Dachau and Auschwitz experimented with barbiturates, morphine derivatives, and mescaline for interrogation. According to Walter Neff, a prisoner's nurse involved in experiments at Dachau said the goal was to, quote, eliminate the will of the person examined. Although the ultimate conclusion of the Nazis' work with mescaline was that it was, and I quote, too unreliable to be a truth drug. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And if a truth serum works sometimes, and at other times it doesn't, well then it's not a truth serum. The whole point is to get someone to tell the truth all the time and reliably. Anybody could tell the truth sometimes. These experiments, their aims and conclusions, however, were likely unknown to the Allies until after the war. All they had to work with was that intercepted communique. The earliest example of the U.S. using drugs for interrogation happened in 1941, but the earliest mescaline research for the purpose happened when the OSS, again a predecessor to the CIA, quote, set up a truth drug committee in spring of 1943 under Dr. Winfred Overholzer. In the same year, mescaline was tested in a Philadelphia hospital. Three OSS officers volunteered, but the experiment was a dismal failure. None of the three men had given up any information. Despite this failure, researchers came away with some key insights. First, cannabis indica seemed to be a more promising substance for their purposes. Second, they developed a set of criteria to find their drug of choice for the truth serum. One, it must be administered without the subject's knowledge, which, as you may recall, is similar to what the CIA did with MKUltra. Two, it must induce a talkative mood and, if possible, a full exposure of the truth as the subject knew the truth. Three, it must be non-habit-forming, or physiologically harmful, which is like the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act. And four, it must leave no remembrance or suspicion of any kind. And this this is alarmingly similar to the conditions attempted in the CIA's research into LSD, and later reflected in our drug policies themselves. However, the insights also lent themselves to suspicion on the part of the intelligence personnel. The thought ran that if we are this far into our search for a truth serum, and the impetus on such research came from an intercepted communique, we should develop techniques to prevent our people from succumbing to truth serum, which research has already shown to not exist in any reliably way. So, you end up with something like Project Blueberg, which stated its goals as follows, quote, A. Discovering means of conditioning personnel to prevent unauthorized extraction of information from them by unknown means. B. Investigating the possibility of control of an individual by application of special interrogation techniques. C. Memory enhancement. And D. Establishing defensive means for preventing hostile control of the agency personnel. And to bring this full circle, on April 13, 1953, the CIA authorized Project MKUltra, an umbrella project on mind control, which included all Bluebird and Artichoke projects and additional research. The additional research was on radiation, electroshock, various fields of psychology, psychiatry, sociology, anthropology, graphology, and paramilitary devices and materials. According to the CIA director Richard Helms, the main parts of MKUltra were designed to, quote, investigate the development of a chemical material which causes a reversible, non-toxic, aberrant mental state. This material could potentially aid in discrediting individuals, eliciting information, and implanting suggestions in the other forms of mental control. Folks, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This is... This is all true. I mean, it's from documents that have since been declassified by the CIA and leaked to the press. 
they're out there. You can read the documents if you please. They're fascinating. Um, strange, to be sure. I feel a little out of my comfort zone, like I'm stepping into conspiracy theory territory, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means. I like, you know, hard facts before I speak about something, especially on the show. So this is... It's strange. That's the best way I can describe it. It's definitely strange. But moving beyond this anecdote on the military, I want to bring it back full circle. There is presently a conflict around specifically peyote. It is an offshoot of the war on drugs that Nixon described, a skirmish that, while seemingly small compared to the larger and more audacious conflicts in the war, could be a turning point in drug legislation. The Native American Church of North America, which was established in the 19th century and was a result of that cross-pollination of traditional tribal beliefs and Christianity that we discussed earlier, the church requires a substance in order to perform rites and practice their religion. The substance, as you probably guessed, is peyote. After all, another name for the church is peyotism. And I want to zero in on the Canadian branches of the church, because in Canada, peyote is a legal prescription drug. Therefore, to practice their faith legally, the members of the Native American Church of North America would require a medical prescription. Let's take a step back from the concerns of the church. Imagine for a moment the incredible pressure this puts on doctors who may or may not have much experience with the substance. And they are then asked to stand as the gatekeeper between a group and their religious beliefs. The conflict between the Native American church and the Canadian government made foot soldiers out of doctors with prescription scripts as their weapons. The responsibility of permitting or prohibiting a group's sacraments has been placed on the shoulders of doctors who likely care little for their charge. So what are the arguments against peyote use as a sacramental wine of sorts? What questions arise in this conflict? The first is that peyote causes death. It's a rather weak argument. It could be valid if you showed that the typical dose of mescaline, again, the active substance in peyote, is deadly. If that was the case, I would buy into this argument because then it would be clear and obvious that the substance is dangerous. But simply stating that the substance kills in large doses is irrelevant. What does not kill us in large doses? Table salt, alcohol, tap water, coffee, aspirin, all kill you in large enough doses. Most substances will kill you if you take enough of them in one sitting. If that was the reason behind the peyote ban, well then we would live in a world deprived of legal consumables. If the substance was lethal in regards to how Native American churches use it, then we should see evidence by now that's been causing unprecedented amount of deaths in the Native American Church of North America, but again, it simply is not there. The argument is a weak one and honestly quite embarrassing to make with a straight face. Next, we have the line of argument from the CSA. Peyote may be addictive. This is a slightly stronger argument, but this... That's not a compliment. Humphrey Osmond lays out this idea in a recent article, quote, A recent report from Fort Leavenworth, the U.S. Government Narcotics Center in Kentucky, states that up to that time, of thousands of addicts admitted none had ever found to be addicted to peyote, unquote. In fact, there is a wealth of research around mescaline and LSD being used to help people battle addiction, specifically alcoholism. The third argument against the use of sacramental peyote is that Indians who take peyote regularly become mentally, morally, and physically degenerate, intellectually deteriorated, apathetic, disinterested, incompetent, and poor. This argument is just as weak as the first one. If this statement were to be true, there would be ample evidence pointing to a correlation between peyote use in the Native American church and imprisonment high recidivism rates, unemployment, poverty, lack of education, lack of higher education among the community, but that evidence simply is not there. The claims made here in this argument around peyote on this battlefield are baseless. But these claims form the battleground upon which the Native American church and the anti-drug advocates debate. 
I want to be clear and careful. Do I think the legal status of many psychedelic drugs is ludicrous? I would say I do, and I do not believe that statement is an objectivity-shattering revelation. I harbor bias in regard to this topic. I think most everyone does. That is not to say I believe in indiscriminate psychedelic use. That's not true. There are many in mainstream media that advocate on the behalf of the clandestine producers of psychedelics and self-proclaimed psychonauts, and while this is all well and good, this kind of thinking inspires a certain exploitation of a delicate balance. For example, in at least one town in southern Ecuador where psychedelic tourism has replaced the more traditional use of San Pedro, there is evidence that indiscriminate over-harvesting is seriously impacting the sustainability of this natural resource in addition to contributing to serious community conflict in the area. I fear that this may soon become a trend as opposed to a single case. If a sort of psychedelic renaissance is upon us, we must be careful of the deleterious effects such a paradigm shift may have on the plants themselves and the role those plants play in their respective ecosystems. And I mean ecosystem as an all-encompassing term, the relation of humans to where they live and what they consume, because I'm no environmentalist, nor am I a psychedelic advocate, but these ideas in relation to one another should be thought about with a clarity I do not think has yet been considered. I'm Thomas Thompson, and this has been Dirty History. If you like what you heard here, I can proudly say that this show was produced by Muckraker Media, which means that I can recommend to you other shows on the Muckraker Media platform. So if you like what you heard here, you can get similar stimulating content on Plato's Cave and Mime Theater, two other Muckraker Media podcasts. Find out more on muckrakermedia.org or wherever you get podcasts. As always, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And if you are truly feeling frisky, support what we do on Patreon. With that said, thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Again, we're on social medias. You can find us at Dirty History Pod or Muckraker Media. I'll talk to you soon.